Hunter Valley Community Church. If you guys would stand and join us in worshiping our God. We're going to start with Blessed Assurance. Praising my Savior. 
Lord, let us just now come before you. Lord, we need you so much, Lord, in our lives.
the place of your dwelling, the place of reverence in our lives. Lord, we know that we need you. That without you, we cannot stand. Father, I ask that you help us to respond to your spirit right now. You are the God of the universe. There's so many reasons to praise you, Lord. Let us make you a priority in our life. Not a second thought. Not just a tradition that we do on a Sunday morning, Lord. Lord, be to be a sanctuary.
bow before you now in praise and adoration. Lord, we give ourselves now to you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
of you. Real quick, show of hands, if you've been there, please raise your hand. So you can see probably about a third of the people in here have been there. If you're not familiar with that, that is Colorado City, Hillville, uh, Colorado City, Arizona, Hillville, Utah, right. So that town is actually split in half. State line runs right now to the middle. Long history there. Uh, it's FLDS, fundamental Latter-day Saints. Uh, polygamy was a huge thing there. Uh, PBCC has been going out there for, help me out, eight years maybe, seven years? Let's say. This will be our fourth year, my right family. Um, all I can say is it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of cooking. It's a huge outreach, a lot of fellowship, and a lot of ministry. It's very rewarding as a community that's hurting immensely. It's getting better, but they're not there yet. And you saw, uh, I didn't see Liz, but I did see Brody in the video. And he runs a church up there that has been growing significantly over the past few years. If you're able to go, I highly recommend it. If you want, you maybe saw some of the hands that were up. Feel free to talk to those individuals to get some good insight on what it's like. But again, I highly recommend going. There's also another uh, mission trip at the end of July. That's for the high school, and they're going to uh, Mayor, Arizona. Uh, I haven't heard much about that. What, what's involved there, but I can guarantee you that that's also going to be very rewarding. So that leads us into this Wednesday, the 25th, here, we're going to have a car and dog wash. If you have a small dog, I can guarantee you that the kids will figure out how to multitask. They'll use that little dog to wash the car. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because <laughs> Um, so anyways, that's going to be this Wednesday between 5 and 7.30, and then there's also another fundraiser, which is at the beginning of June. Yeah, so June 3rd, Friday, you can drop off things for the rummage sale, and then the rummage sale will be the next day on Saturday, June 4th, and that's always a huge success, and it's a lot of fun. And, uh, if you have questions, you can reach out to Pastor Jeff, who are always looking for volunteers for that as well. And then on also on June 3rd, there's the prayer walk. Uh, that will be meeting here at the church parking lot. I, I want to encourage everybody for that. And the dinner groups also, that's a huge thing. I love that. They're still accepting sign-ups. There's more information uh, out there. And you can put it on your connection card if you're interested in that as well. And then men's camp firemen. I, I haven't been able to attend very many just because of work, but if you haven't been, I highly encourage you to do That's very rewarding itself. With that, I want to encourage everybody to just get up and say hi to each other. Meet and greet. Wow. I didn't have to. No, you guys didn't have to quiet me down. Man. We're ready. Yes, amen. Amen. Well, as you can see, there are a lot of exciting opportunities coming up, and uh, uh, we're really looking forward to uh, what God has planned for us this summer in, uh, in many different ways. So uh, think about, pray about how, how, you will, how you will be involved. I also wanted to share that it's exciting. Uh, just as you look out here, you're going to see this area changing as the gathering place outside is being developed and uh, and coming together, and uh, uh, we're, we're getting a schedule together of how people can be involved and help out, and also want to let you know that there was a significant gift given, uh, and we can praise the Lord for that, because that's going to help us go a long way to getting that completed, and God being able to use that uh, in us and uh, through us. So, amen to that. Amen, amen to that. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, pray and look to our Lord. Lord, we, uh, we, we do thank you for the privilege of being your people and the great purpose that there is of being your people. And Lord, we praise you uh, this morning uh, for who you are, what you do, how you work, the way you work in our world and the way you work in and through us. 
And Lord, we do pray as we sang this morning that you would prepare us to be a living sanctuary for you. With thanksgiving, may we be your sanctuaries, Lord. Lord, we thank you for including us. We thank you for using us. And we ask now that you would speak to us in this time together, and that you'd speak to us by your Spirit and through your Word. We pray this in you, Jesus. Amen. If you take out your notes, if you haven't taken them out already, and you could uh, turn to Matthew 25 if you'd like to be there ahead of time for when we are going to read that. Now, there's this meme that's been going around uh, for some time now. It's many different versions of this, but it says, no one has claimed 2022 as your year. And we have talked about this as a church, and that we are sensing and have sensed the Lord calling us, leading us, to claim 2022 as our year, Pine Valley Community Church, in which we are refocusing on what matters most, the advance of the gospel of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, bearing witness to the reality that Jesus is King. What well, I want to ask you, just even now as we've talked about this, where do you sense that in your life this year? Have you been praying? Have you been thinking about that for our church body and for us as individuals within the church? Michael Lindsay has uh, spent three years uh, interviewing 360 evangelicals uh, who had achieved what we could call substantive uh, positions uh, in their work or in their career, so business, politics, academics, media, entertainment. And he wrote this book by, by this title, and the main focus is how these successful individuals integrated their faith and their work. These leaders had uh, climbed, what we could say, the professional ladder, but had not uh, jettisoned uh, their religious faith that they had or their religious identity. And he concluded, on the whole, that they remained different from other leaders, and the reason that he gave for that was their faith. But Lindsay's research in his book, Faith in the Halls of Power, suggests that the conclusion that he reached was actually uh, quite generous. Because as you look at the evidence provided in the book of how these leaders' lives and lifestyles were different uh, from their uh, secular peers, there are actually appeared to be somewhat little evidence. Almost none of the interviewees raised the issue of exorbitant CEO pay. Less than half of the business executives reported that their faith influenced how they invested their money. Several executives, when they were asked about how their faith affected their work, pointed to a plaque on the wall, or some of the ladies to the cross that they wore. Of those in Hollywood, Lindsay wrote, they differ little from others in the entertainment industry. They drive luxury cars, live in exclusive communities, and worry that their fame and talent will evaporate overnight. More than 60% of Lindsay's interviewees were not involved in a local church. And almost none were a part of what you could call maybe an accountability group to deal with the temptations and the challenges of having great uh, prestige and power and wealth. Amy Sherman, in speaking about this in her book, Kingdom Calling, writes, on the whole, on the whole, uh, Lindsay's careful research showed that, that the vast majority of evangelicals perched atop their career ladders in various social sectors displayed a profoundly anemic vision for what they could accomplish for the kingdom of God. Now, we are in this series in the uh, book of Acts, and we're seeing who Jesus is, what he is doing, how we are to respond to him. And we have seen that Jesus is king, and his kingdom is arriving, and we are to bear witness to him. Now, we've also seen that, that uh, God has two fixed parameters for the history of the world. <clears throat> really, for our lives and our living as we're part of that. And if we are wise, we will fix our focus 
and live our lives in relation to those two fixed parameters. See, the scriptures tell us that we are to live radically different lives, or lives that are radically different from the world that is around us. And we're going to take it aside just here for a little bit and talk practically how, about how we are to live between these two fixed parameters that God has. Now, we read Jesus' last words before his ascension with his disciples. We read in Acts 1, 7 and 8, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And what Jesus is saying is that there are times and there are epics that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And Jesus is saying we're not to know everything about those events or about those times or the timing of it all. But it is very clear as we begin to read in the context and the whole of the scriptures that there are two fixed points that God has made for the history of the world. And everything in the story of the Bible points to and revolves around those two fixed points. The Bible speaks of them in many different ways. The day the world changed, the beginning. The day the world will change, the fullness. The death and resurrection of Jesus, the new beginning. Jesus return, the fullness. Jesus enthronement in the heavens, the new beginning. Jesus' enthronement on the earth in a reunited heaven and earth, the fullness. Jesus' ascension, the new beginning. Jesus' return as king, the fullness. The beginning of the arrival of the kingdom. The fullness of the arrival of the kingdom. And the book of Acts tells us in this time in between we are to bear witness to Jesus as King. Acts is also telling us, and you can write this in your notes, that we have power by the Holy Spirit to bear witness to Jesus as King. That is to be the fabric of our lives as those who have given our allegiance to Jesus and come to know Him. Now let's turn to Matthew 25, and that's about three quarters of the way through your Bible there. First book in the New Testament. And Jesus has finished talking about his return. That's that second key fixed event. And in Matthew 25, Jesus tells three stories emphasizing the wisdom and the necessity of living your life in light of Jesus' return. He uses three metaphors, the bridegroom, the master, the king who is returning to bring his kingdom. And each of these stories are about how you prepare for Jesus' return. That is what we are to do in this time, in between these two fixed parameters that the scriptures are about with the arrival of the kingdom of God. So now let's read. We're going to read the, the second one of those stories. And, and, and again, these are very important stories because they're looking at our outlook, at our understanding, at our attitudes, at our, at our actions. And again, we're going to read just one of these about how we are to conduct ourselves in this time of living between these parameters. So uh, Matthew 25, uh, verse 14 through 30, uh, let's read this parable about the master and his servants. For it, that is the kingdom he's talking about, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. 
enter into the joy of your master. And he also had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also had received the one talent came forward saying, Oh, master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no, no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. That's the reality. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to he, him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant out into the darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, this parable is about Israel. And about God's intent with Israel, or the role that Israel was to have to bring uh, the nations, to restore the nations to God's blessing. This parable is also about Jesus' disciples and what he's going to do with his disciples. The role they're going to have in the kingdom. The arrival of the kingdom. And then as we follow the chain, this parable is also about us. And Jesus says, For the kingdom will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted to them his property. You see, this is who God is and how God rules the world. This is what God is like. He entrusts his estate to others. That's what God has done in the very beginning. Some people call it human historical responsibility. Responsibility for the leadership of and the unfolding of history. Some people call it the cultural mandate of care for our world and care for our culture and care for society. That is who God is and what he does and the way that he works. He entrusts his estate, he entrusts his mission to others. He did that at creation. Even after the rebellion of Adam and Eve, he did cast them out of the garden, but he did not take away their power. He did not retract the cultural mandate. After the flood, Noah and his family, they are still had responsibility to fill the earth as God's image bearers. And God had his purpose and his mandate for culture and creation in calling Abraham and his descendants after Babel. And he did that with Israel and the conquest of the land and how they were to partner with him in taking the land. And he entrusted his estate and his mission into the care of others. And we know all of this because of what Jesus said and did. When Jesus came to the earth, he continued to operate according to the Father's uh, uh, <coughs> modus operandi of sharing power. It's been written, the royal king shares his power with commoners, disciples who, like us, are so often marked by folly, pride, weakness, and cowardice. And you see, Jesus came and he shared his power to heal the sick, to cast out the unclean spirits, to declare the arrival of the kingdom. And he did that with the twelve, and he sent them out. Then he did that with the seventy-two disciples, and he sent them out. And when Jesus returns in the new heaven and the new earth, we as humans are going to continue as God's vice regents, sitting on thrones with Jesus, ruling in the new earth. You see, God is into sharing his power. We just think in uh, Revelation. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father 
on his throne. Now think about that. Wow. And then in Revelation 5, this is about Jesus. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. It's talking about, Worthy are you to bring history to its consummation. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Where are they going to reign? Or are we... If we are conquerors, going to reign on the earth. And it says, they shall reign. We shall reign. Plain and simple, God is into sharing his power. Again, Acts 1.8 is about God sharing his power, his purpose, his plan, his mission. And that is from the beginning of the scriptures all the way to the end of the scriptures. From the beginning of history to the end of history into the life of the age to come that's coming. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. My witnesses. Two fixed points, parameters for the living of our lives in the history of the world. And for those who have repented and believed that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, we are given power by the Holy Spirit to bear witness that Jesus is king. And what Jesus' parables and teaching are telling us is that his kingdom has begun to break into our time and our space by his spirit. And Jesus as king wants us to realize that the kingdom of God has begun to break into our time and space. Think about that. That is reality that is happening now. Have a place in your notes to, to, to write there uh, with that, down, down towards the bottom third of the page. That reality is to permeate, affect, influence, and involve all of our lives. And you could, you could write that in there. You, you know, it's too bad how we see the church in our culture today. See, we tend to see the church as a time and a place. But that is not the church at all. In fact, you can again write this in your notes. The church is the people of the king who are sent out in the world on mission with him in his power in the inbreaking of his kingdom. You see, the church, if we see the church accurately, we are sent out on mission to bear witness of Jesus being the king, and we are deployed across all the fabric or all the domains of our culture. And you see, what we're doing when we gather together now, that is, this time is to fill us and to encourage us and to equip us and to challenge us and to help us to refocus and persevere and be wise and be faithful in being sent out each week. See, if the church is truly being the church, we are deployed during the week. No question. Where are you sent out into the world? What are your ministries? See, your jobs are your ministries. Where you go are your ministries. Your neighbors are the neighborhood where you live are your ministries. Paul says in uh, Corinthians, he has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. The Spirit produces life. And you see, the new covenant is the kingdom. And what Jesus was doing with his healings and deliverances were foretaste of the kingdom. And that is what we, Jesus' disciples, Jesus' people, are to do as well. That is being ministers of the new covenant. We bring foretaste of the kingdom to our work, to the places that we go, to our neighbors and neighborhoods where we live. And you see, God has shared his power with us. We are his fellow 
workers. And here is the central truth of God's message to us this morning. <laughs> we bear witness, and there's a place you can write this in your notes, we bear witness to Jesus and bring foretaste of his kingdom in our work. See, we are ambassadors of Jesus being king. We bring foretaste of this kingdom everywhere we go, whatever we do, because of Jesus' presence being with us by the Holy Spirit. So we bring taste of God's goodness and rightness and restoration. We bring taste of new creation coming and a world put right, of love and compassion and beauty and generosity and focus on care and blessing of others and flourishing of society. See, the Old Testament, when we read in the Old Testament, it points to a world put right and harmony and peace and prosperity. When Jesus came, he pointed to a world put right. And he brought foretaste of the kingdom. When he healed diseases, when he cast out unclean spirits, when he proclaimed or announced the kingdom, when he, when he spoke and controlled the elements of nature, it was like Jesus reaching out into the promised new creation, the promised new heaven and new earth, and pulling back or yanking back foretaste in the presence of that kingdom which is coming. That happened in Jesus' presence and in his ministry. You see, the kingdom of God had begun that's what the scriptures are telling us. The gospels are telling us that the kingdom of God had begun to break in to time and space in the present with him. That is also happening in our time. Through Jesus' presence by the Holy Spirit in the church, the kingdom is breaking into our time and space in the present. <coughs> And with that, we are the bringers of foretaste of the kingdom that's coming in full when Jesus returned. When Jesus began his ministry, he set out what his agenda was. I, I'm going to get this <laughs> sooner or later. He set out what his agenda was in uh, quoting part of Isaiah 61. And here we have it in Luke 4. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as we read that, what we see is rescue and compassion and freedom and justice and mercy. In other words... What Jesus is reading and what he is talking about is affecting society, turning the world on its head, putting the world right. And again, in Jesus, we see foretaste of that wherever he is present as he's going and carrying out his ministry. As ministers at our jobs and where we go with our neighbors, we are deployed as the church as well to offer foretaste of the kingdom as we live radically different lives in bearing witness to Jesus being king. And this morning we're going to hone in on one aspect of that, of bearing witness to Jesus in our work. Here's the reality. To embrace, and again, the church isn't a time or a place. It's God's people deployed and sent out on mission with him. And being on mission with him in our ministry, we bring those foretastes of the kingdom to our workplace, to our environments, to our careers. Again, foretaste of rescue and compassion and freedom and justice and mercy and beauty, just to name a few. Foretaste of harmony and prosperity and peace and flourishing and generosity and caring for the needs of others in society. So society can function in ways that are good and are blessed. See, these are all ways of bearing witness to Jesus in our work as we are deployed as the church. Pastor Victor Pence explains to his church, at most you will spend 5% of your waking hours here on these premises. 
95% of your life you spend in the world. Now, this 5% is critical in giving us a navigation system to help us orient, to help orient us in the Christian life. Amen. But the scorecard is about the 95% we live out there in the world. And that is the church deployed to the world. The 95% is the scorecard. A church in Atlanta describes this biblical understanding of the church this way. For followers of Jesus, who we are is a person created in the image of God. Amen? Your work, whether you are in banking, insurance, construction, solar, or cleaning, a homemaker, or a teacher, or in medicine, or maintenance, or fabrication, or technology, or security, or retired, or whatever you do, is important to God. Your work, your life is vitally important to God, and He invites you to partner with Him in that, just as He invites you to worship Him. And indeed, we do worship in our work. We are fellow workers with Him, and He has good works for us to do. Again, Paul says this, Now, because we are fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. We are fellow workers with God. He talks about us also having good works that He is doing through us. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is Paul talking about the church. And that's what the parable of the stewards is about. And Dallas Willard said it well. Jesus is actually looking for people he can trust with his power. As we read Jesus' parable, in fact, if you turn your notes, we can, we can write this in. Jesus entrusts gifts to us to be deployed in advance of his kingdom on this earth. He entrusts to us, he gives to each of us talents, gifts, passions, skills, abilities to be deployed in the advance of his kingdom. And these are talents and gifts and passions and skills and understanding and wisdom and abilities and strength that bring foretaste of Jesus' kingdom that is arriving through us. We serve him with those talents and abilities as his image bearers. And our attitudes at work, the things we put our, our, our thoughts and our minds and our energies to, our wills to, the things that we put our hands to, the ways that we work, our aims at work, the work that we choose to do, or the way that we seek to influence the things <laughs> that take place at work, or the way that we handle ourselves at work, or what we seek to accomplish through our work. All of these can bear witness to Jesus being king. And we are to be radically different in the way that we speak, and love, and serve, and live in loyalty to Jesus. We are to be radically different in how we see things, and what we choose to do to bear witness that Jesus is king. In your notes, you can write what we're saying here. We are to be radically different and bring foretaste of the kingdom to the places we work, where we go, our neighborhoods where we live. Now, there's a theme in Proverbs 11 that contrasts the righteous and the wicked. Just even as we read in Jesus' parable, this contrast between the righteous and the wicked. And in Proverbs 11.10, it says, and I have this in your notes, and uh, may also have this up here in just a second. Uh, <clears throat> when the righteous thrive, a city rejoices. When the wicked die, there is joyful shouting. Now, we're going to unpack the first part of this uh, because it's instructive in bearing witness to Jesus. The NIV says it translates it this way. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Now, I have in your notes, Pastor Tim Keller explains this in one of his sermons. And again, I have it there in your notes. The righteous in the book of Proverbs are by definition those who are willing to disadvantage themselves. Maybe you want to underline that. For the community. While the wicked are those who put their own economic, social, and personal needs 
ahead of the needs of the community. In other words, the righteous are the just. They're the ones that, that follow God's heart. The ways of, of living with Him as King or for Him as King. And they see their talents, their desires, their skills as gifts that have been entrusted to them to advance the kingdom. In other words, they see everything that they have as being entrusted to them from the master. Let's go back to the parable. From the master to be stewarded for his purposes of compassion and justice and restoration. See, this is the upside down advance of the kingdom. This is how it takes place. It says, when the righteous thrive, when they prosper, that's when they have power, when they have wealth, when they have standing. And the city rejoices. Now that is a really interesting statement because we, what we see in our world is that those who have power and wealth and standing use it to gain an advantage and actually to take for themselves, to take from others. And, and given human nature apart from Christ, the rich just keep getting richer, the poor just keep getting poorer. But you see, this is an opposite scenario that's being talked about here in this passage. See, the folks at the top, as they continue to thrive and be at the top, the city, including those at the bottom, are rejoicing. Now, why is that? Well, because as uh, Amy uh, Sherman writes in her book, and again, I have this in your notes, it is because the righteous view their prosperity not as a means of self-enrichment or self-aggrandizing, but rather as a vehicle for blessing others. You may want to underline that. Everyone benefits from their success. You see, the righteous steward everything. They, they steward their money, they steward their vocational position that they have, their assets, their resources, their opportunities, their education, their relationships, their social position, their net, networks, all of that for the common good, for advancing God's compassion and justice and restoration and mercy and goodness. And when the people with power and wealth and standing like this do this, the whole city cheers. It's like, yeah, right on. Everyone benefits from the foretaste of God's blessing. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Now that word rejoice, it describes this just ecstatic eruption. Like in a time when people are free from oppression. It's kind of like, the war is over and we won. Yeah! That's the picture that this word is giving. So when we consider what this is saying, we realize that those with power and, and, uh, and standing and wealth, as they live like this, they are making, what this tells us, they are making a significant positive impact in the world around them, in their sphere of influence, in their city. Because everybody is rejoicing. It's like they won a victory. Now this gives us some insight in what it means to bear witness to Jesus being king. And also when we realize that each and every one of us have some measure of power and influence. Wealth. Standing. In our work. And where we live. And where we go. We have power and influence in the kinds of attitudes that we have and how we work. Power and influence in our knowledge and skills. Power and influence in how we go about our work to care about others. And we have wealth. We may not feel like it, but we're like in the top 10% of the world. Maybe more, maybe more than that. And maybe we may not feel like we have standing, but we do in different ways with different people. And beyond that, we have the Holy Spirit and the power of God's presence with us. I have this at the very end of your notes. Those who bear witness to Jesus' kingship are radically different from the world around them because they recognize everything in their lives is being given to them by God and they steward those gifts in order to bear witness to Jesus being king and to bring foretaste of his kingdom into the world. 
through hard work, through courageous acts, through persevering endurance and bringing compassion and rescue and encouragement and, and mercy to bear in this world, by loving others, using their power to care for the marginalized and their power to help society, skills and abilities, opportunities to bring freedom, to bring justice. What we're talking about here is more than taking our clothes or our old furniture to the goodwill. We are talking about bringing foretaste of Jesus' kingdom into reality, in the present, in real and personal ways. I think of one man in our church, of what he did in helping an a elderly neighbor numerous times and in different ways. Uh, from protecting her from people trying to take advantage of her, uh, to organizing some of our church folks to, to come and help and deal with a major issue she was facing. Again, the church being the church deployed into the world, bearing witness to Jesus being king. I think of another man in our church who, who uh, treats everyone with respect, even those he knows are criminals and breaking the law. I think of another who is honest and works hard in encouraging and managing others because he realizes he is bearing witness to Jesus in his work. I think of a lady in a church who consistently shows acts of compassion towards others. I think of others in our church that, that use their skills and abilities just to provide for or bless, for, or bless others in the, in the flourishing or the blessing of society. I think of others who are retired, yet they're using their time and their energy and their skills to invest in others, to bless others, meet the needs of others, and advance, uh, give foretaste of the kingdom, advance the kingdom. A, a lady uh, by the name of Bonnie uh, Wurzbacher was for years the senior vice president of global customer and leadership at Coca-Cola Company. She shared how she uh, came to believe, this is what she shared, God has an important purpose for every institution. His purpose for business is to advance the economic well-being of communities throughout the world. As the sole source of wealth creation, Business enables every other institution to exist. Schools, colleges, missions, churches, government, everything. Business is very important, noble work throughout the world. Bonnie shares that in their economic impact studies that they did, that on average for every one job they created directly, indirectly it created 12 other jobs. She went on to say, I believe that I am helping to bring God's kingdom here on earth when I participate in a successful, ethical, effective business that helps communities improve their economic well-being and enable everyone associated with it to contribute to the larger good in the world. That's like saying, bringing foretaste of the kingdom through her work. Bringing God's blessing to communities and helping them flourish. All of us, all of us have some dimensions of vocational Power, knowledge, expertise, reputation, skills, connections, position, platform, uh, networks, many different ways, many different people who we may have some kind of influence or power in our vocations. With at least someone, we can bear witness to Jesus being king and bring foretaste of his kingdom into their lives. When I was back in the workplace as a young man working as an assembly man, I didn't have much knowledge or skill or expertise as I worked in that role. But I did have an awareness of my purpose, of my work, and of caring for others, and uh, being a bearing witness to Jesus. And with God's Spirit with me, empowering me, I was able to bring foretaste of the kingdom into my work with my attitude at my work, with my care for others, with my joy in belonging to God. And in doing so, I helped the business to do well. I helped others to do well. And I also showed Jesus' presence to others that then turned to Jesus and opened their lives to receive him. See, the church in being the church is deployed into the world. And being deployed into the world, we are to bear witness to Jesus being king. And in doing so, we are to steward everything 
God has given us to bring those foretastes of the kingdom into present reality. See, that's a critical part of our living and being wise between these fixed parameters. We bear witness to Jesus in our word. From age 25 to 65, you might spend about 2,000 hours here at church on Sundays. But you're going to spend 96,000 hours at work. Do you remember Baskin Robbins? I used to go there when I when I grew up, and it was always fun to try the different ice creams. And do you remember the pink spoons? <laughs> Little test taste spoons? And what those spoons would do is they would offer a foretaste of ice cream to come. <laughs> that were an appetizing foretaste of ice cream to come. As those who bear witness to Jesus being king, we are to live and see ourselves as a little pink taste test <laughs> spoons of bringing common good, God's good, God's blessing, foretaste through us. And we are to grasp that we are missionaries no matter what field, what industry that we work in. You know, retirement. Pastor Andrew Hamilton has said this to his church, and I sense it's an encouragement with all of us in being pink spoons. He says, if we realize we are missionaries first, and we go out into our workday world every day on mission to bless, to love, to heal, to bring justice, to serve God in the workplace, then we, when we finally begin to do that, the world is going to be different. And if we're going to claim 2022 as our year, let's think about being sent ones, deployed out into the world at our jobs, where we go, and our neighborhoods, bearing witness to Jesus being king. He's entrusted to us all that we have, gifts, resources, abilities, to advance his kingdom and prepare for his Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for who you are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God in relationship. The God who is love. The God who is good. The God who forgives and is merciful and kind. We praise you for who you are. The God who shares his power. Who calls and includes his people in his ministry who gives genuine responsibility and opportunity, shared ministry by your Holy Spirit and your gifts in us. Lord, open our hearts today to see who and what the church is, that we are your people deployed into the world to bear witness to you, Jesus. And if you haven't grasped this before, would you begin to embrace this today, to, to rethink your life in this way? That everything you have, your relational skills or your vocational strengths, your resources, is to be stewarded, to bring foretaste of Jesus' kingdom to others. Lord, that your kingdom is coming in full. Lord, thank you for giving us such great responsibility and opportunity and worth and significance. <coughs> Lord, help us to rethink our lives, our work, the places we go, the people we see, the neighbors where we live, to steward all that we have. Help us to embrace what the kingdom is like in this time. To live walk rightly and wisely, faithful servants who will be rewarded when we return. Help us to bear witness to you, Jesus. Lord, even now as we think about uh, and partake in this time of giving back to you, Lord, we want to do that. We want to dedicate those gifts, whether we've already given them, uh, whether we've given online, whether we're giving today and whatever we do, we give. We want to dedicate those to you in our worship, in our faithfulness, in being faithful stewards. We pray all this in you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our Lord. Oh, baby. 